of astonished to see that it has been almost four years now um, that we started working on GTK4. The 3.89.1 release um, came out in November 2016. And um, since then, we've racked up well over 16,000 commits in uh, the GTK master branch. And we've had um, a couple of fearless early adopters um, come by at various times to port some applications uh, to early snapshots. There was a Nautilus port, I believe around 396. And then later, Georges came and ported GNOME to do around 3.98. Um, and we were also very lucky um, to be able to observe George's um, attempt to use our new drag and drop API live as just as we had committed it. And um, we learned a lot from that experience and our drag and drop API is a lot better as a result. Um, so um, thanks a lot to all those uh, early adopters. But um, now GTK4 is almost here. And um, in fact, I was hoping to have a 3.99 uh, release done before Guadec. Uh, that did not quite happen. Um, we're still waiting for Emanuele's accessibility API to land that he was talking about before the break. Um, but that uh, 3.99 release uh, will happen very soon, either during Guadec or shortly after. And our plan for the 4.0 release is uh, still to get it out the door before the year is over. Uh, so now is a, a great time to take a detailed look at what it will take to actually port all your applications uh, from GTK3 to GTK4. So in this talk, I will um, take a, a, have a focus on the basic aspects of um, uh, custom widget functionality and uh, how it changed in the move from GTK3 to GTK4. Um, that will also give us a chance to um, take a look at the um, core aspects of, um, of GTK, um, that, such as um, rendering and layout and uh, input handling, and see what changes have happened there. But before I dive into details, I wanted to take a short amount of time to um, explain a little bit the principles um, that have uh, guided our work on GTK4, so you have some idea uh, what the motivations are behind uh, some of the changes you'll see later. And um, the first one I want to mention here is um, the first general direction of API uh, changes has been to emphasize delegation uh, over subclassing. Um, one of the motivations behind that is that uh, it hopefully makes writing custom widgets easier and less error prone. Um, as a consequence of that uh, direction, you'll see a lot more auxiliary objects um, that take over certain aspects of core widget functionality. And you'll also see that um, a lot of widget classes are now final, since you are actually expected to derive directly from GTK widget. I think you could maybe summarize this principle as lessons learned from Clutter, if you wanted. Yeah, another uh, general direction or general trend in our API is that we want to treat everything as a widget as far as possible. Um, that started already in GTK3 with, uh, when we slowly broke up complex widgets. First, uh, we introduced CSS nodes and then gadgets. And now in GTK4, for example, um, the GTK scale widget has uh, a trough and a slider, which are not just gadgets, but they are fully formed sub widgets, which can maintain their own style and their own state, and uh, they can handle input just like every other widget. Um, a big loser in the transition from GTK3 to GTK4 is uh, GTK container. It has become, as a base class, it has become much less important. Any widgets can have child widgets now, and um, child properties have been replaced by uh, layout children and their properties. And all the focus handling has moved from GTK container up to GTK widget. So there's uh, really not much uh, use for GTK container at all. And in fact, it has lost so much that it um, does not even exist anymore. We have um, gotten rid of it. Another big loser is um, GTK window. In GTK3, all the um, pop-ups and all the different kind of pop levels, such as entry completions, menus, tooltips or combo box dropdowns all had a, were using a GTK window underneath somewhere. And uh, we've replaced all, most of that with popovers or with GTK pop-up surfaces. 
And in addition, uh, we have untangled the popover implementation from GTK window. And we've also moved uh, some part of top level specific uh, GTK window functionality out into uh, separate interfaces such as GTK root or into sub widgets just such as uh, GTK window controls. So uh, overall, uh, GTK window.c is a lot less scary than it used to be. And on the on the GDK level, um, we've moved from uh, modeling our uh, abstractions on X11 concepts to following uh, Wayland. As a consequence, uh, we now have surfaces instead of windows, and things like screens or visuals or explicit graphs are all gone. And we are moving to um, uh, move away from the complex input device hierarchy that uh, was characteristic for X input two. Overall, these changes should not really affect applications too much because um, uh, they don't directly necessarily use uh, these objects, but it does affect uh, GDK backends, and hopefully it makes it uh, a lot easier and straightforward to write new backends. In fact, just yesterday, um, we merged uh, the beginnings of a new OS X backend um, which still needs some work before it's uh, fully fleshed out, but uh, I think it's a hopeful sign for things to come. Uh, moving on from principles to surprises, um, with any uh, change of this size, uh, such as uh, moving from GTK3 to GTK4, um, there will always be uh, some surprises or annoyances, uh, unexpected changes that you did not see coming and that will hold up much longer than they should, uh, and they'll probably leave you angry and annoyed. So I figured it might be a good idea um, to point some of these out beforehand so you are forewarned and don't get blindsided. Um, the first one I want to mention is um, that widgets are now visible by default. This is uh, one of a, uh, uh, one kind of API change that we've made in a number of places where the default for properties were sometimes just wrong in the past because when you are creating a new widget, um, it seems very likely that you also want to show it. So having visible default to true uh, seems like the right thing to do. Um, but nevertheless, if uh, you have a UI file that in GTK4 now suddenly looks uh, entirely different than it did in GTK3, you may want to go and check that uh, there's no, not any uh, widgets in there that were always hidden before because nobody set the visible property to true and that are now showing up. Another surprise uh, is that, as I already mentioned, GTK container has gone. And um, that is uh, probably a bit more annoying than uh, the visibility of widgets. In particular, if you're creating your UI manually by calling GTK container add on, on a lot of different containers like boxes and windows, uh, you have to replace those calls um, by the non-generic uh, per widget API that we have replaced it with, such as uh, for for GTK box, for example, you would call GTK box append, or for a window, you would call GTK window set child. And that's admittedly uh, painful and annoying, but it's a one-time change. And the good news is um, you are not affected by this if you are using a UI file to load your UI because the child element in UI files works just the same as before. <coughs> there are some other changes in UI files that, um, that will need uh, you to adapt them, for instance, uh, the change from child properties to layout properties. But um, the good news there is that GTK for Builder tool uh, can help you with this conversion. If you pass the dash dash three to four option to the GTK for Builder tool simplify command, it'll try to read a GTK three UI file and um, uh, try to convert it to a GTK four one. Now this is a an imperfect tool, so uh, you should always um, verify the output that it produces, and you should probably check the warnings that it spits out. But we've run it uh, over all the UI files in GTK several times during the GTK4 development, and uh, it generally works fine. So that's a very useful tool that you should have in mind as you uh, try to port. With that being said, um, uh, it's time to start talking about what it actually takes to port a widget. If you have a custom widget, there's, uh, I think, maybe four uh, four main things that uh, uh, 
such a widget should do. It probably needs to draw something, otherwise why would you have a widget? And more likely than not, it will have some child widgets that uh, need to be laid out and uh, sized and positioned. And you will also want to handle input and probably uh, connect to other parts of your application by triggering actions or uh, communicating changes. So that's the, the four topics I will uh, walk through in the rest of the presentation. And I'll try to do some live demos. Uh, wish me luck for that. Starting uh, with drawing. That's one of the uh, areas where we first made radical changes as we started uh, developing GTK4 by changing um, our target. We're no longer targeting Cairo as uh, our rendering API, but instead we are targeting OpenGL or Vulkan. And as part of that change, we're moving from a more or less immediate mode uh, style to a, a retained mode uh, style. In GTK3, basically, you, you got a Cairo context and you, you draw your widget context, uh, your widget content on it. And in GTK4, uh, we are maintaining a scene graph that the widgets add render nodes to. And you can then uh, take that scene graph and pass it to either to a renderer that would translate it into OpenGL, or you can do something else with it, process it in a different way, maybe save it to a file and load it again later. So there's a lot of power that comes with that. In the uh, GTK widget API, that this, this change is reflected in the change from the draw vfunk to the snapshot vfunk. If you look at the draw vfunk up top here, you'll see that um, we pass a Cairo context in there that uh, that Cairo context collects the pixels as the widgets draw their content. And in the snapshot vfunk at the bottom, that's uh, the GTK4 API, we pass in this auxiliary GTK snapshot object, which collects the render nodes and adds them to the scene graph um, as widgets uh, render their content. Um, there's, of course, a lot of uh, different content that uh, is important in a GTK window. All the CSS style information um, also gets translated into render nodes um, that's done by GTK itself. And GTK will add those render nodes uh, to the scene graph before calling the snapshot function uh, so that every widget automatically uh, complies with the CSS rendering um, drawing model without any extra work on your part. So the responsibility of your custom widget is purely to um, produce its custom content in its snapshot implementation. And if you're doing that, you'll probably uh, want to call some of the convenience API that GTK Snapshot has for, for doing that. For example, GTK Snapshot append texture if you want to um, draw a texture or GTK snapshot append layout if uh, you need to render some text with the Pango layout or GTK snapshot append Cairo if you want to um, do some custom Cairo drawing and you need a Cairo context for that. <coughs> I do have a demo that shows um, how such a snapshot function can look, but before um, trying to run that, I wanted to briefly stop and uh, say that um, if you just need some self-contained uh, Cairo drawing, a GTK drawing area is still a perfectly valid option for that. The only difference between GTK3 and GTK4 here is that we no longer have the draw signal, uh, so you will have to call GTK drawing area set draw func to um, tell GTK about your draw function instead of connecting a signal handler to the draw signal. Everything else is uh, just the same. Uh, you'll get a Cairo context and you can just uh, draw with Cairo as usual. There's of course also still um, GTK GL area if you want to do custom drawing with OpenGL, um, but nothing has changed there. So I'll just um, skip over that in this presentation. And um, yeah, now I'll, I'll um, leave the safety of a slide deck and try to do a live demonstration. Um, wish me luck. I hope you can see my screen now. Um, I'll switch down here. Um, so um, let's see. We're talking about drawing, so I prepared a little uh, drawing demo here and um, try to point out the interesting parts here. Um, so in our widget class init function for my demo widget, uh, you can see I'm overriding or implementing the snapshot vfunk here. And 
that's the only thing I need for a widget that does custom drawing. So things have uh, really become a lot simpler than they used to be. And if we scroll up a little bit, here's my um, snapshot function. As, as you can see, it gets the uh, snapshot object here. And then we call GTK snapshot append color a few times to uh, just produce some render nodes. And that's, that's all there is to this. So I'll run this now. And as you can see, there's our four um, differently colored render nodes. Um, and they resize if I resize the window. So that is all as expected. I will now bring up the GTK inspector by typing Control Shift I. And what I wanted to do here is show you that there's a recorder tab in the inspector, which lets you um, gain some insight into the scene graph um, by basically recording the frames as GTK is drawing them. I need to actually uh, cause some redraws here by resizing the window since GTK is pretty good about caching um, render nodes and only generates new ones when actually necessary. But now I have um, some recorded frames here. And as you can see, um, there's a, a tree of render nodes. And um, up here, the first few rows, you see there's a CSS background node, which is uh, where GTK automatically translated our CSS style into uh, render nodes. And then down here, um, there's the, the render nodes that were produced by my snapshot function. As you can see, there's, um, there's four color nodes, which have the colors that I gave it. So um, yeah, that's um, interesting. And that is uh, very useful if you want to debug uh, what's going on with your custom drawing. Now let me see if I can. Stop sharing my screen again. Okay, I hope you can see my presentation again. Let me just skip through um, my fallback non-live demo. And uh, now let's uh, talk about layout. Uh, because maybe your custom widget is not actually doing custom drawing, but it arranges uh, a bunch of child widgets in some way which is actually something that we recommend. We want everything to be a widget um, as far as possible. So for example, if you need some text, then we prefer that you use a label for that, a label widget, rather than draw the text yourself with the Pango layout, unless you absolutely have to. Um, so the main responsibility of a custom widget that uh, arranges child widgets, of course, is to um, do the layout work. In GTK3, you would do that by implementing size allocate. And um, you can still do that in GTK4. Um, but a more convenient alternative nowadays is to uh, create a layout manager and have it do it for you. GTK comes with a number of uh, built-in layout managers uh, for all the uh, typical container uh, widgets that we used to have. There's a GTK box layout. There's a GTK grid layout. There's a center layout and uh, various others. Um, so you can uh, choose one of those. And um, layout managers can be created and attached to a widget in the widgets init function. You can also um, create them in a builder template and get, get them that way. But the easiest way to um, get a layout manager for a custom widget is to just um, set the layout manager type in your in your class init function by calling this enormously long function that I put here, GTK widget class set layout manager type. And then GTK will create the layout manager of this type for you when it instantiates the widget. Now, having a layout manager is not very interesting if you don't have any child widgets um, to arrange. So you probably want to create uh, child widgets as well. And uh, usually that is done in the widgets init function. and so you create the widget, and then you need to um, make them a child, which is done by calling GTK widget set parent. We'll see an example of that in a little bit. One thing I wanted to mention uh, before doing that is um, if you uh, make a widget a child of your custom widget by calling GTK widget set parent, then you are responsible for cleaning up when your widget is going away. Usually that's done in the dispose function um, by calling GTK widget unparent. Right, and I um, will try to 
share my screen again uh, for another live demo. Okay, I hope you can see that. And let's move in now. There it is. So this time we look at the layout example. So um, let's start by looking at the class init function again. As you can see, I'm calling this function with the long name um, here to set a layout manager type. And I'm using a grid layout. Yeah, one thing I also wanted to briefly point out here while we're looking at the class init function is that I'm no longer implementing snapshot. Uh, that is not necessary unless you actually want to do custom drawing. GTK will automatically snapshot your child widgets for you. So as long as uh, you only want to lay out child widgets, you don't need to implement snapshot yourself. Um, I'm going to scroll up to the widget init function. And here you can see I'm creating a couple of child widgets for labels. And I'm calling GTK widget set parent on each of them. And um, then I have a dispose function that undoes that again by calling GTK widget unparent. So let's, let's see what happens when I run this demo. And this is very small. I hope you can see this anyway. And there's a little oops there. As you can see, my four child widgets have all appeared, but they all appeared on top of each other, which is not what we wanted. So something went wrong here. And in fact, what went wrong is that we forgot to move the children each to their own cell in the grid. In GTK3 with a uh, GTK grid widget, you would do that by setting the left attach and top attach child properties. Now we don't have child properties in GTK4 anymore, but we have uh, layout properties that replace that. And we can hopefully fix this in the inspector by um, going in here. And if you look at the widget tree, there's our demo widget and it has um, the four labels as children. And if I now um, look at the details of the first label, you can see there's a layout tab here, which in fact has the uh, layout properties that I was looking for left attach and top attach. So let me just set them for the first widget. And now I can just step to the different children and set these properties. And as you can see now, the widgets are placed into different cells in the grid. So this is more like uh, what we were hoping for, I think. And I'll, I'll leave it as an exercise to you to combine this demo with the previous demo and arrange for the labels to show up on top of the right colors. That's uh, an exercise for the user, for the, for the reader. And I hope we're back to the presentation now. Let me once again skip through my non-live fallback. Right, time to talk about input. Um, in the previous areas, we've already seen a, a number of auxiliary objects taking over um, the role of uh, widget signals. And this trend is much more pronounced in the area of input, actually, because we used to have quite a few different signals there, uh, basically one signal for each kind of event. There was a button press event signal and a focus in event signal and a motion notify event signal and so on and so forth. And uh, all of these are gone in GTK4. And instead, you're expected to use event controllers. And I've named the, the corresponding event controllers here in the slide. So instead of a button press event, you're expected to use a GTK gesture click event controller. And instead of a focus in event signal handler, you'll use the GTK event controller focus, and so on and so forth. Um, to make the migration to this new uh, style of handling input a little easier, we've brought a lot of the basic even controllers back to GTK3, so you can already use them before you um, start the porting work uh, for real. But um, we couldn't quite uh, bring all of them back. A number of them were either introduced very recently or they rely on infrastructure that just is not present in GTK3, so we could not, for example, um, backport the even controllers that we are now using for drag and drop in GTK4. Um, yes. The unifying uh, principle behind uh, all these different event controllers is that GTK propagates all the input events that it receives from the windowing system in a uniform way. 
They are all propagated from the um, top of the widget hierarchy down towards a target widget and then back up in a pattern that is uh, commonly referred to as capture bubble. So the blue arrows here, that's when the event goes down towards the target widget is the capture phase. And then the red arrows, when it propagates back up, that's the bubble phase. And at each uh, point along the way, at each widget, um, the, those widgets, even controllers get a chance to inspect the event and handle it in whichever way they choose. And I should maybe say that um, the way the target widget is chosen depends on the kind of event. For key events, the target widget is the current focus widget. And for pointer events, the target widget is the currently hovered widget, basically what's currently under the pointer. Right, and I do have another demo for this. I apologize in advance that this demo is a little less convincing maybe than the other two. I was struggling a little bit to find an interesting um, demo, so I just made a boring one. If you look at um, the widget, the demo widget init function here, you see that I still have um, two child widgets. I dropped two of them because four was too much. And I do create uh, two event controllers here now. Those are click gestures, and then I connect a signal handler to their press signal, and I attach the controllers to my two child widgets. And uh, scrolling up a little bit, here are the, the uh, signal handlers for those two signals, and they don't do anything interesting. They just print a, a string so I can see that they were actually called. And if I run this, Um, and I click on red, you see that the text appears, and if I click on blue, the other text appears. So that is all as expected, but not very exciting. Okay, I hope you can see my presentation again. And I'll skip through my fallback here. And um, so part of uh, the reason why this demo is not very, was not very convincing or not very interesting is that there was no real need to use the event controller here in the first place. I could just have used a button widget instead and connect to the clicked signal. Um, other reason why it's not very convincing is that there was no real action to be triggered. I just printed a string. Um, and maybe that's uh, something we should fix. So uh, let's talk about actions and, and what we can do for that. Um, yes, that means basically G action, which is something that uh, has been around for a long time, ever since we uh, started doing app menus in GNOME 3 and we needed to export actions on the session bus. Uh, we introduced uh, G action for that. And back then, uh, actions were mainly global. You were adding them, those actions directly to your GTK application or your GTK application window since we needed global actions. Uh, for the application menu. Now we're not doing application menus anymore, but the but the G action machinery is still around, and in fact we're using it more than ever. And uh, at some point uh, in during GTK3, we uh, added a way to attach actions to widgets that are not necessarily global by using GTK widget insert action group. That is something you can just call on on any widget anywhere in the widget hierarchy. And uh, the actions that you add in this way are only considered for activation uh, when the activation happens uh, below that widget in the, in the widget hierarchy. So there's an interesting scoping that gets introduced this way. Now in GTK4, we added another way um, to add actions, attach actions to, to widget by calling GTK widget class install action in your class init function. That is very similar to the way you uh, install properties by calling gobject class install property also in your class init function. And actions that are uh, associated with the widget class in this way are available for all the instances of, of that widget class. And um, then in the past, uh, you of we often use signals for, for when we needed to connect uh, an event to an action, for instance, you 
had a way to call GDK widget class add binding to uh, connect keyboard shortcuts with uh, action signals on a widget. And basically in every every place where you were using signals for that in the past, you can now use actions as well. As an example, uh, we added a variant of that binding API that's called GDK widget class add binding action, which lets you associate a shortcut with an action instead of with a signal. So let's go back to that input demo one more time and see if you can actually uh, make it a little more interesting by adding an action. <clears throat> so here's my um, here's my uh, demo again, and we'll start by looking at the class init function. And you can see here at the bottom of the class init function, we are now calling GTK widget class install action to uh, create two actions. So you can see we need to pass a name for the action, and actions can have arguments. So in theory, you could uh, provide a G variant type here, but we're not using that. So I'm just passing null as the second argument. And the last argument here is the, the callback that gets called when the action is actually activated. Scrolling up a little bit, here are my two callbacks for my action. They just uh, set a CSS class on my widget just to see that something happens. And then uh, scrolling further up to our uh, to the signal callbacks for our event controllers, um, you can see that we are now calling GTK widget activate action to actually uh, use our newly uh, created actions here. And let's see what happens when we run this. So, so far it looks just the same. And now if I click on the red label, you see that my turn red action gets activated and the red style class gets added to my widget and it turns red. And if I click on blue, uh, similar. So that's uh, a lot more exciting. Right, let me skip to my um, fallback, Oops, sorry. That's where I wanted to stop. So this is basically the material I had prepared for um, giving you some hints of, of um, how porting from GTK3 to GTK4 will look in practice. And there's uh, obviously a reading list here with uh, further information if you want to um, actually try this out in practice. There's obviously a migration guide that is part of our um, API documentation. And uh, we'll try to flesh that out and make it more useful, I think in particular now in the run up to GTK 4.0. So feedback on that is very much appreciated. If anything is missing or unclear, uh, we'd like to know about that. Then there's uh, our GTK blog that uh, we occasionally post some longer form material to. And then there's this course where you can, of course, ask questions, uh, not just about porting to GTK4, but about GTK in general, or about anything else you want to talk about. And then there's the materials for this talk, including all the, the demos that I ran here. I made those available on, on GitLab earlier today. So feel free to um, look over that. And I think I still have uh, a little bit of time left. So I'll, I want to uh, show a few more slides um, with some ideas for what you want to may, maybe explore after you've done your initial porting, because GTK4 has um, a little bit more to offer than just um, the same old, same old. The first thing I want to mention here is um, media support. That's one area where GTK4 is doing I think significantly better than GTK3. In, in the past, whenever we needed image data, GTK PixBuff was our go-to API. And unfortunately, um, GTK PixBuff's API for, for animated images is not very convincing and therefore not very widely used. Um, so in GTK4, we have a new interface for this, uh, for image data, which is called GTK Paintable, which is um, a lot more flexible and uh, much useful, much more useful, I think. And um, the PixBuff is a GDK paintable, but you can also use a WebM file or a MPEG file and represent it as a paintable. That's what the GDK media file class does that I mentioned down here. GDK media file has um, uh, an FF, FFmpeg backend, but also a GStreamer backend um, to load uh, uh, animated images in, in various formats. And our image uh, display widgets, for example, GTK picture that I mentioned here, uh, all accept paintables as, uh, as a source of images and will happily show animated 
uh, paintables just as well as static ones. And I think I can maybe demo that live. And I may have to turn off my um, webcam sharing for that. OK. So I, uh, a few months ago, I wrote this little uh, weekend project to explore GDK's media capabilities, um, which is called Video Play. And um, that's a, a tiny GTK application that is using uh, GTK media file and um, it's talking to the uh, screencast portal. So it's running in a flat pack and it can, for example, get a, a video screen, stream via Pipewire from my webcam and, and show it in a GTK widget without any further uh, dependencies needing to be added here. So that's, uh, I think, very nice and something that you may want to explore once you've done your initial GTK4 port. So let me switch back to my presentation. And uh, there's only one more thing I want to mention here, and that is, oops, that's me. Uh, scalable lists is another uh, big topic that is worth exploring after the initial port. We do have um, model-based uh, list and grid widgets now that recycle widgets and that promise to be a lot more scalable than GTK Tree View or GTK Listbox could ever be. In fact, just uh, this morning we merged um, a lot of uh, uh, intense work that Benjamin did over the last months to uh, make our filtering and sorting of list models incremental so we can now resort a list model that has millions of items in it um, and we can keep scrolling uh, the list view and uh, don't miss a frame while the sorting is going on in the background. So that is a, a very impressive result, I think, and uh, something that you should probably explore. But it's worth uh, a whole talk of its own. So I just um, mentioned it here. And with this, I'll say thanks for your attention. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Oh, thank you, Matthias. Uh, the questions, you can find them in the shared notes, uh, a track one Q&A. Uh, there's a lot okay. of questions waiting for you. You can read them yeah, yourself. Uh, uh, I'm seeing that now, so let me maybe um, start reading the first one. As a developer and new to writing GTK applications, would you start learning on the latest GTK4 or GTK3 stable? Um, that's a... Good question, and it depends a bit on your perspective on like how soon you need results and how widely you want your application uh, to be deployed. GTK4 does not currently exist. I hope it will exist before the end of the year. But even so, if you uh, want your application to run in in lots of different uh, maybe enterprise distros, they will not have GTK4 for a while. So from that perspective, it makes a lot of sense to stick to GTK3 for now, uh, just so you can get your application deployed right away. But if you're interested in exploring some of the new things that I mentioned towards the end of my talk, then looking at GTK 3.99 and just playing with it uh, is probably a lot more exciting and, and maybe uh, interesting to do. OK, so the next question is, uh, how does one get started moving an application using PyGI and GTK 3 to GTK 4? Um, I think our, our binding support should be um, in pretty good shape. Uh, we have we do ship uh, uh, GUR files and uh, uh, type lips, and, and those should uh, actually work maybe better than in GTK3 because uh, one of the things we did as we did all these API changes was to make the API hopefully a little more uniform and easier to bind. Like we've em emphasized properties uh, a lot more, so everything that can be reasonably be made available as an object property. Uh, should probably be an object property now, so that should make it easier for bindings to fully support uh, our functionality. Um, yes. Next question is, what is the cross-platform story for GTK4, and does the Vulkan backend help at all? I think those are two pretty separate questions. The first one, the cross-platform story, is, um, well, not much better than in GTK3. Um, we do have a, a Windows backend that uh, is 
semi-actively maintained by a few people who um, actually work on Windows. Uh, so I think it is in, in decent shape. But we did not really have any anybody working on the OS X backend until, as I mentioned during the talk, until very recently, uh, Christian Hergert uh, broke down and actually wrote a new OS X backend, which hopefully improves our OS X um, story uh, quite a bit. Um, that is not using Vulkan, though. That is, um, I believe, currently using GL. And we'll have to see a little bit um, where that is going. The Vulkan backend in that we have for um, for GTK in general is um, uh, somewhat complete, but uh, the focus uh, over the last year, I would say, has been on the GL backend. We really don't have, an, have enough expertise to uh, actively push forward multiple backends at the same time. So currently, the GL backend is the one that is um, actively driven to completion for GTK4, I would say. And the Vulkan one is more or less uh, left as a as an exercise for the future to, to polish up and bring up to par again. OK, um, let's see what the next question is. Um, can you elaborate on the use case of bubbling up events? Um, uh, that's a good question. I, uh, one answer is that um, more or less we are following uh, patterns that you can see in, in other areas. Like Emanuele said earlier today, is for the accessibility work, we are basically following what the web is doing with ARIA. And uh, for event handling, it's kind of a similar story. Um, we're basically trying to be sim more similar to the web than, uh, than we were in the past, just because uh, everybody knows the web. And we win by being similar, because everybody knows that. And on the web, events work that way. They capture and bubble. I say, uh, Concrete use case for where the difference between the phases uh, is important is uh, in, in things like uh, scrolled windows, where you may want the scrolled window to, to eagerly grab scroll events to be able to scroll, uh, even when there's widgets underneath that may also be interested in, in scroll events. And uh, these use cases are uh, sometimes difficult to resolve satisfactorily, but having those two phases makes it at least possible Matthias, we lost you. <laughs> Cat killed the mic. Hopefully, he will be back soon. It's back now. Oh, really? Can you hear me? Yep. Amazing. I swear my cat was not involved. I mean, I don't know what happened. Anyway, um, uh, let me let me go back and maybe answer uh, one or two more questions here. Um, what do you think is the most exciting new change in GTK4 that you think deserves the most fanfare? So um, that's a Sorry. good question. Sorry, Can you, you, are, you are a bit loud, a bit okay. lower. I probably cranked up the microphone to see what happened. OK, so um, what am I most excited about? That's a, an interesting question. It changed a little bit over time. If you had asked me that same question a year ago, I would have said I'm mostly excited about the constraints, uh, even controller that Emanuele was working on back then that we have landed. Um, uh, but so far, we haven't really uh, embraced that much. It's, it's there, and it works, but we haven't really um, made exciting use of it. I'm kind of excited about it for like the prospect of doing a UI builder that would use it. But uh, so far, nobody has shown up to, to do that work. So my excitement currently recently is driven by the work that Benjamin has been doing on, on list models and scalability, because that, uh, as I mentioned uh, during the talk, it's really quite impressive to see how we can now um, filter and sort 
really big lists and uh, the UI just stays uh, responsive. That's just not something you could do before. And uh, I think that's that's an exciting thing that we should uh, make use of in our applications. And uh, that sometimes requires uh, some remodeling um, of uh, the application infrastructure. All our uh, our list widget work is based on uh, GTK, our NG list model, which is uh, a very simple container interface for just uh, presenting a list of objects, but you need to have objects for it. So for example, uh, earlier this week, I was looking at LibG weather with an eye towards uh, maybe uh, making, uh, uh, untying it from its GTK3 dependency and making uh, the time zone data and the location data available in, in a form that can easily be dumped into one of our new list widgets. But it turns out that the G weather time zone and G weather location uh, structures are not actually objects currently, they are uh, box structs. So we'll have to change that to take advantage of, of this new uh, infrastructure. All right, maybe one more question here. Um, will GTK-based apps run faster under my Pine phone when ported to GTK4? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know that I can actually give you an honest answer about that. I hope so, but I, I think that depends to a large degree on uh, on whether the GL infrastructure on that Pine phone works well and whether we get to use it. Um, but um, I certainly hope we have the potential to make uh, GTK work better on more platforms just by having this new uh, rendering infrastructure. All right, there's a question here about uh, QML. Can we have something similar to QML but for GTK UIs, um, yes, maybe if somebody is working on that. As I said earlier, uh, it would be great to start working on a on a new UI builder where we could use uh, constraints and where we could maybe also uh, have something that is more more akin to QML uh, than what uh, our builder XML currently gives us. But that uh, I guess up to whoever ends up working on, on a new UI builder. <clears throat> right, this, the last question here is, um, what's the plan for adding an animation API? If I recall correctly, that was a goal for GTK4 at some point. And yes, um, that, is, that is correct. That was a goal that was on our list of, of, on our wish list of features that we had targeted for GTK4. Um, back when I, announced GTK 3.98 at the beginning of the year. It was still on the list uh, of things that we wanted to land, but it, uh, at this point, we've decided to drop it from the list because it turns out that it just needs um, more infrastructure work inside GTK to make, um, make it scalable and make it work well, um, that we just don't have the time to do that if we want to uh, still release GTK 4 before the end of this year. So we decided to to drop that uh, from our list for now and pick it back up uh, after GTK 4.0. And we'll see if what we come up then is compatible with something that we can merge into GTK 4 during its life cycle or whether we need to um, make that a GTK 5 goal. That's to be seen. I think Emanuele might have opinions on that. And if there's no additional questions, then I uh, once again, thank you for your attention. And um, that's it. Oh, there's a, the last question. What's the GTK4 release date? Good one. Um, so I think I can make it more concrete than what we've said uh, so far before the end of the year. So my goal for the 3.99 release is to have it out ideally before the end of next week. And then we'll see um, how many uh, point releases uh, we do between 3.99 and 4.0. But uh, at that point, all the major APIs should be in and should be um, basically, uh, we should be in the polish phase where we focus on, on writing documentations and writing examples and um, preparing the ground for 4.0. And yes, there's another question. Does that mean that uh, GTK WebKit is making progress? Yes, um, there is an, an active porting effort to make GTK WebKit work with GTK4. And as far as I know, that is uh, working pretty well and uh, more or less done, last I heard.
Is that all? It seems like it's all. I think that's uh, all, yes. So uh, thanks again. Uh, thank you, Matthias, for a really, really in-depth presentation about